Quite a nice layout you got here. Pretty cool, huh? And I know it's a, it's a great opportunity for everybody to maybe leave their hometown for a little while and party, if you know what I mean. I know why you come here. Thank you. Okay, Mitch, I'm all yours, brother. Sort of. Hey, everybody. How you doing? I'm Mitch Gallagher from here at Sweetwater. I have the privilege of getting to talk with Steve. Thank you very much. How about that? Was that was that a uh, was that an incredible performance or what? Really killer. And we got chairs. We have chairs. So let's do it. All right. So let's begin with a really simple question. Steve. Steve. Yes. What does tone mean to you? Tone. Well, you know, it's funny. I'll tell you a little story about tone. 
when I was going to college at Berkeley College of Music, I was, I was mostly just focused on my technique. And I actually didn't even have a great technique. My, my picking technique was kind of weird. It was, it was kind of like up here. And I, and I picked with my whole wrist, sort of. And I could play fast, but it sounded like, you know, it just, you know, like the tone of the note. You ever see guys that pick like this and they can play fast, but it kind of doesn't really sound good? So, but that was me. And it wasn't until I was on tour with Frank Zappa. Yeah. <laughs> At their tender young age of 20, and uh, I was, you know, I was enamored with Frank's music when I was a kid, and there I was in his band. It was kind of a shock. Still is. And uh, I remember after the first show we did, it was in uh, Tucson, Arizona, I think. And I saw Frank the next morning having breakfast. And I went in and I said, so how, how was it? How was I? You know? And he said, you know, Steve, I think you're a pretty good guitar player. But your tone sounds like an electric ham sandwich. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean? I got the Strat. I got the the marshal, and uh, Frank said something, because he was a man of very little words, and you had to go figure it out. And he said, your tone is in your head. And I never knew what he meant by that until later in life, when I actually started to understand this. And what I've discovered, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of moving parts when it comes to finding your tone. You've, You've got the guitar, the shape of the guitar, the finish of the guitar has something to do with it, the pickups, the amp, the all, all sorts of moving parts that have something to do with the quality of the tone. But, the, but they're all kind of this big compared to the number one, which is the way you hear yourself in your head. Y your tone is based on the way you hear it in your head. I know that sounds kind of weird, maybe a little esoteric, what, what does he mean? But really, the tone you're striving for is always gonna be something that you can only hear in your head, so to speak. So what I started to do was, uh, I started listening very carefully to my tone, because I never spent a lot of time on it. And then all of a sudden, um, I remember there were some guitar players that hit the scene that kind of just changed everything. Like Edward, when, when Van Halen came out, right? Whoa, what the? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's tone, man, you know? And then Ingve, you know, I remember when Ingve hit the scene, we were just all like, what is, what is that? And I remember this was a, 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 a big thing for me because Ingve was in this band called Alcatraz. Yep. And I, had to, uh, and I had to replace him, and I had two days. And I was still picking like this, you know, so it didn't sound very good. And I realized I had to, I had to change everything. I mean, obviously, I, I didn't want to sound like I could, it can't, you know. I, you can't really sound like anybody except yourself. So I started to really put a lot of focus in the tone and, and, and so much of it has to do with just, you know, where you're picking, how you, it has to do with how you're hitting the note and the kind of intention that you're giving the note. Uh, attention and intention, you know, what I, you know what I mean? Right. And I just started, and to this day, that's what I do. I, I listen in my own ear, in my own mind, for something to strive for on a tonal basis. And that's how you improve your tone. You know, you, you actually have to hear a better tone in your mind to strive for. And what happens is your fingers just start all of a sudden going there. You know, the, the fingers are attached to what you're thinking, you know. And if you're hearing and imagining better tone, it's, you, your fingers will find it. Your fingers will find it. As a matter of fact, because I, I'm talking about Ingbe, because we, we travel together, and, you know, with Generation X. Sure. And... Uh, and are you guys familiar with Generation X? Yeah. June 28th, the record's coming out. And, uh, you know, we, all of us, Zach and Nuno, and, you know, we have, a, we have a great time. And 
some of the some of the best times on the Generation X tour are on the tour bus after the show. These guys are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but they're really great, and we tell stories and listen to music and all this stuff. And it was very interesting because we were talking to Ingve one night about his tone. And he told the story of how when he was growing up, when he was a kid, he was interested in violin music. Now, um, and he wanted his guitar to sound like a violin. And, and he told the story, and I know this is true, when he was doing his first interview in Japan, when you do interviews for Japanese guitar magazines, they want to know everything. I mean, they want to know... They <laughs> one time, I was there, and I had this guitar, not this one, another one, and I had a sticker, a little sticker of a whale on the back. It was just a sticker, like from Cracker Jacks or something, right? And they said, Mr. Steve, what is that sticker? And I said, well, you know, the, the, the quality of the tone of the way a guitar resonates <laughs> is based on the tonal relationship of the neck and the body. That's not, that's not false. I mean, if you, if you hit... It, this is an octave. The relationship is an octave, which makes it a... That's why I like this guitar. The, t the tone, they resonate. And I'm explaining this to them. And I said, but this guitar, which is my favorite, it was a little off, so I had to do something to the resonation. So I put this sticker on it. It deadens the neck just the right amount. <laughs> do you know that I was looking at Japanese guitar magazines after that, and they were selling guitars with whale stickers on the back? <laughs> But uh, in the quest for a perfect tone, or the tone that's right for you, you're also going to investigate a plethora of gear. And I do that too. Yeah. And one of the things that I've, uh, I've discovered, um, and you know, us humans, if you notice something, we're always striving for two things, right? I'm not talking about sex yet. <laughs> we know, yeah. That's a given. We're always striving for convenience and quality, right? If you, if you look at the arc of the evolution of technology, that's what we want. We want more convenience and better quality. And why not? We deserve it, right? <laughs> so you deserve that with amplifiers, too. And uh, I'm just so thrilled because recently... Um, I discovered this, this uh, amplifier company, Synergy, right. that makes these uh, amplifiers that are more module. So they actually have authentic preamp modules from historic amplifiers. This is not modeling. This is actual, the analog tube section of uh, preamps of these historical amplifiers and also contemporary uh, cottage industry, high-end, uh, boutique-style amplifiers, you know? Yep. And so you get, actually get these modules that are authentically analog preamps built by these guys. I mean, m many of you may be familiar with uh, Dave Friedman amps. I mean, outstanding quality, and he's a brilliant guy. He, works, he worked on this module that I have now, which is the Vi module. I was going to call it something silly, but I had enough of that. <laughs> so this, this evolution of technology for me in the amplifier field has been really helpful and useful. Right. Yeah. And that's one way to track down a tone. Another way is you start experimenting with pickups and things like that. But really the tone, if you find it in your head, if you can imagine in your mind the kind of tone you want, and I'm talking about like really picturing it and hearing it, it will just manifest. You'll find yourself navigating and being attracted to different things as you meet friends that are playing, that are uh, when you go to a music store perhaps, or you're reading on one of the online, you know, or you're spending six days breezing through the Sweetwater webpage. <laughs> that's easy to do. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's a, right. yeah. Right. 
So I want to go through your whole signal path, but you kind of glossed over it. So you used to pick with your arm. Yeah. Man, making a change in your technique like that to a different technique is a pretty major undertaking for most players because your muscles yeah. are trained certain ways. How did yeah. you go about doing that? Slowly. Yeah. Yeah, because you have to be really patient. If you start um, overstepping yourself, you, you, the foundation of what you're doing is crap. Hmm. You know what I mean? So you gotta really be patient and find find the notes slowly, and then put them together till they sound good, you know. And it, it wasn't that difficult actually because yeah. um, the moment I discovered that you know going like this and then picking down here is uh, it's much easier and better. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I, I was telling you the Ingve story, and, and he was doing an interview with the Japanese press, and if you ever watch him pick it, it, it looks like he's knitting. <laughs> you know, it's just going, it's like that's going, <laughs> yeah. and they said, well, well, how do you pick? And he said, I don't know, I never looked. <laughs> because he, he let his ear tell his fingers what to do. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? He, f he was chasing something in his head, and whether you like his playing or not, th th there's a lot of respect there for what he has accomplished. Yeah. It's phenomenal, really, the way he... I mean, I watch it this close every night. I'm like, I still can't figure out what. Right. But it's, uh, you know, that, that's a very interesting concept, and it proves that you, you listen to it in your head, and then it comes out. Right. Yeah. Right. So let's take a tour of what you're playing through on stage here, All which right. is kind of a downsized version of, of what you would, would tour with. Oh, yeah. let, let's uh, start with a guitar. You have a long association with Ibanez, yeah. and, of course, the gem is, what, 35 years? 34 about 34, years? yeah. Years. Uh, tell us a little bit about that story. Yeah, sure. When I... Uh, was a young player when I was 14, 15. I loved uh, Jimi Hendrix and Jimmy Page, of course. Uh, I knew instinctively that I had to have a guitar with a whammy bar. As soon as I saw that whammy bar, I was like, oh, that's got my name all over it. <laughs> and, uh, but I didn't like the way strats sounded back then, you know, like the single coil just didn't represent rock and roll to me, and I was a metalhead, you know? <laughs> See, I say metalhead in the motorcycle. <laughs> Could never afford a motorcycle, but I stole my brother's now and then. It was a Harley, <laughs> big chopper like this, you know. <laughs> so, um, and I couldn't really, I loved Les Pauls, but I couldn't really sit with them, you know, because they were kind of off balance and they didn't have whammy bars, so forget it. Right. <laughs> and then uh, Edward came out with the Super Strat. Well, they called it the Super Strat. And it was the first time you could see a guitar with a single core, a humbucker in a, Strat style body. So I said, okay, that's the right direction. Mm -hmm. But because I was uh, working for Frank, Frank uh, was, the, was like an explosion of freedom. You know, Frank did whatever he wanted. He would think of something and then just do it without making any excuses or expecting somebody to do it for him. And he did that with everything. So he did it with guitars too. So I started thinking, what is it that I'd like in a guitar? And I remember I was 20 years old. No, nobody knew who I was or anything. And there was a little uh, guitar shop in Hollywood called Performance Guitar. And I thought, you know, I really like 24 frets. No, nobody was, there was like, uh, maybe the Jackson had 24 frets, you know. But I don't really remember many guitars then. But I thought, hey, more is better, right? <laughs> and... Uh, and I could never understand why those guitars, um, you, you, they had frets, but you couldn't reach them. You know, you ever tried playing up high freely on a, str on a Les Paul or a Strat or any of those guitars? It just doesn't work. It's like, duh. <laughs> you know? So I made this cutaway so that it perfectly fits my big hand. So I can reach with no problem uh, the high notes. And uh, grabbing high notes is a little difficult sometimes. So I... I came, uh, uh, the, we, we decided to scallop the top four frets. Which got a good idea. Got that idea from Billy Sheehan, because right. he was doing that on his basses. And I thought, oh, good idea. Yeah, right. And that's how you do it. You see good ideas and you borrow them. <laughs> 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 and then um, I kind of changed the shape a little bit because this is much sexier. <laughs> I just like the way it's shaped, you know. It kind of looks like me a bit, skinny, long neck, you know. Whammy bar. <laughs> I'll be putting that away. 
But uh, a couple of the things that I really wanted to see was the, the, uh, a unique pickup configuration. And that was basically, I love this, the double coil sound in the, in the neck position and the treble position. But I really like that uh, clean, stratty type sound when you have two single coils. So. Uh, so like for instance, uh, this switch we made back then, and it was kind of special because in, the, in this position here, you know, you get the, this is the, the humbucker, and then when you go in this position, it splits the coil, so you get two single coil pickups. So you get that. I mean, it's not entirely stratty, but you get that. kind of like that clean kind of, and a lot of delay, because I love delay. And uh, that, was, that was unique at the time, that pickup configuration. So I'm told now, sure. yeah. And then a couple other things, simple things like uh, the input jack. A lot of guitars had them kind of down or like this, so you could step on them and they'd fall out. Right. So I was like, you know, just put it like this, duh. <laughs> and then um, one of the things I wanted to do was um, I wanted to pull really high on the whammy bar, but most guitars just wouldn't allow that. You know, the, the, the best was a Strat, and, and maybe it would... I mean, you can go low with a Strat, but you just couldn't, you know. So at that time, thank God, there was Floyd Rose, and he came out with this system, a little different now, and uh, with the fine tuners and everything. But I couldn't figure out why I couldn't make the, the guitar go really sharp, and I noticed it was just just some wood that was keeping the bridge from going up. So I took a, I literally took a hammer and a screwdriver and I just whacked it, you know, and splinters flying everywhere. And next thing you know, I, you know. <laughs> that's my idea of a good time. <laughs> yeah. And that was, you know, um, I believe, as I'm told, the first floating, real floating tremolo system to be that. Uh, so if ever you see a guitar that has a cutaway back here. <laughs> yeah. I know I'm bragging. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when technology is evolving, we're all in it together. We're all working together. There's no real ownership in a sense. You know, we, right. we, 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 if you notice, we're always all working together. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the mind likes to say, no, that's mine. That was my idea, you know. And, uh, but in reality, you're always contributing to the bigger picture for everybody, you know. Because th this and anything on this guitar that was incorporated into other guitars was an evolution. And that's what we're here for. You know? We all stand on the shoulders of everybody that comes before us. Right. But having said that, <laughs> I felt it was important to do at least one ridiculously quirky thing <laughs> that is a good representation of my abstract thinking and quirkiness that I don't think anybody would, you know, kind of use. <laughs> <laughs> the monkey grip. But then what happened was uh, I had these guitars and they were working really good for me and then I joined Dave Roth's band and many guitar manufacturers wanted to manufacture these guitars for me. And I said, hmm, that might be nice to have somebody make me a guitar for free. Yeah. You know? But they all wanted to do it. So I sent out the design to you know, anybody that was interested and inevitably what I got back was their guitar with my name on it. And I'm like, well, that's not gonna do it, you know? except for Ibanez. They brought me back the absolutely most perfect, brilliant guitar. It was a gem, gem from head to toe, and it hasn't changed since for 34 years. And I am so fortunate because that company, can you imagine? I went to them and I said, <laughs> I want this guitar exactly like this. Oh, and by the way, it has a monkey grip, and they're like, oh! Oh, and by the way, I'd like to release it in three neon colors, pink, green, and yellow. Oh! 
you know, and they did, and it was a wild success. Right. It's the most consistent selling guitar. I can't believe it. For 35 years, my royalty checks have been killing me, man. <laughs> you know? It's awesome. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. I'm so, so grateful for that. And through the years, Hoshino Ibanez has just been so supportive and so focused on keeping it real with the guitar, you know? Really specific about the quality and very, um, very creative. A lot of the things that they've brought to me were, uh, but that you see on some of the permeations of the gem in the past have been their idea. Mm -hmm. Like the one where my blood is in the guitar. <laughs> that was funny coming from a company like that. Mr. Steve, we think you should put your blood in the swirl of the guitar. And all I like to think was, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> so I actually, if, uh, this is the DNA guitar. Some of you might be familiar with it. But uh, I didn't put like a few drops of blood. I went to the hospital and they pulled vials of blood <laughs> out of my arm and dumped it in the mix and swirled the guitars. And you can see it. It's like really there. Wow. Yeah. So I tell people if, in like 100 years from now, if, if they clone, uh, <laughs> use the guitar and get my DNA and actually clone me, right. maybe that guy can get his music on the radio. Because <laughs> <laughs> this guy can't. <laughs> uh, and then it was so great because um, not too long after the gem, um, I thought, hey, I know, I want to make a guitar with a seventh string, a lower string. And that, that was really the birth of the production model, the first production model that I know that we know of. You know, whenever I say things like this, people always come back and say, no, no, there was this and there was that. Fine. You know, it was the first time I knew of it and it was fantastic. Right. Because the seventh string kind of when I was using it, I was using it a particular way. Mm -hmm. But I knew, I just instinctually knew that there was going to be these kids that would come along that would really you know, tune that seventh string down and do something f phenomenal with it. And I'll never forget the day I was driving down the road and this music came on the radio. I actually had to pull my car over and listen to it. I was so blown away. And it was corn. Mm -hmm. And they were pumping away on the seventh string, you know. And uh, it was nice because it kind of created this whole subculture of tuned down right. kind of, you know. I mean, those guys were really responsible, but... I had a, uh, you know, it was nice to have a little part in contributing. Sure. Yeah. Right. Right on. Right on. So you've also, uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. And the royalties keep coming in. <laughs> so part of the voice of this guitar is the DiMarzio pickups. Yes. Are those high output pickups? What do you look for from a pickup? Well, I've changed through the years. I try to change it up every four or five years, just, mm -hmm. just to have something different. And with Larry, Larry DeMarzo, he's another one of these incredible supporters that they're not happy until you're happy. And he'll send me as many pickups as I need to hear in order to adjust it to the point where I'm, I'm satisfied with it. So what I like to usually uh, go for is more like a, like a tight bottom, mm -hmm. but, but not, not to where it's unfriendly, you know? And... Um, a high end that has a, a sort of a, a curve to it that sings, you know. It, I, I, I like with the, the, a little compression, you know, high output. Okay. And um, because I, I play guitar all night, you know, if, if you come to one of my shows, you're either seeing me solo or play a melody <laughs> and an occasional chord. <laughs> but uh, that's a lot to, to listen to. So it needs to be a friendly tone. Right, right, sure. Yeah. sure. And the DiMarzio pickups are a nice uh, element in shaping that. Right, definitely, definitely. So you come out of the guitar, and in the case of this pedal board, which is a, a, a Friedman pedal board, Friedman design pedal board with the interface box and the, the power supply and everything, and uh, we're coming out and coming into a wah pedal. Which wah pedal are you using okay, here? Okay, well, occasionally I use different things. Of course, I have the bad horsey, but... Um, I use that, I, I kind of prefer that, but in certain situations, it, there's, we're still working on... And there's space here, space issues with this board yeah. that we're trying to fit within as well. Yeah, so 
And then I have a, this is a simple setup, so then out of the guitar, it, it, out of the wah-wah into my Gemini distortion, and then I go into this uh, whammy pedal mm -hmm. for a couple of fun effects. And then that goes into the front of the uh, amp, but then out of the send, out of the back of the amp, well, I should say not out of the um, out of the module send. Right. So now this is your line level area. So it's um, it's where you want to affect the signal to get the best quality effect. Now some effects work better in the going through the loop of the amp as opposed to the ones on the floor. Like I would never put a wah wah or a distortion through the back of an amp. It just if I did, it would just be for some kind of weird effect. Sure. You know? But delays, digital delays are really great. So the output from the back, the send, goes into this co stereo chorus where the signal gets split. Mm -hmm. And then one, g one side goes into a di digital delay, a Roland, uh, I mean a Boss uh, DD7. And then um, the other side goes through one, two. And I just have those set up a little bit to kind of bounce off of each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they return back to a Synergy 5050 power amp that then feeds two speakers. Right, okay. Yeah. Now, this is just my jam rig setup. Sure. Yeah, my, my full rig is, especially right now in the studio, it's pretty monstrous. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, this is kind of the compact version of, of what you're doing. So the two delays there, you mentioned you have them set differently. Are you looking to those to provide more ambience, or do you use tap tempo with those, or how do you integrate those with your tone? Well, I in my rig, every they're MIDI, and they switch based on the song. But here, I, I just I have them on. I could turn them off, but the, the two songs that we're playing, mm -hmm. uh, they work well, you know. So, and if you want to hear those, it's kind of this is this is one side. Yeah, the feedback's a little much. So you can hear that, right? and this this is the other side. So when you put them together, you get, and that's kind of nice for. Sounds good out there, right? You got. You should hear what it sounds like right here. And then when you, you know, when I've got the dirty channel, it it sings. You know, you just. You can hear the delay. It's what you call noodling. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. So let's let's jump back. That's the the pedal board and how you're integrating the effects. But uh, of course, you mentioned the new Vi module, mm -hmm. and you've got three other modules in the rack here as well. Tell us how you. Well, first of all, tell us about the Vi module. Well, um, another really great advantage of being Steve Vi <laughs> is I have all these wonderful people that are willing to make stuff exactly the way I want it. Mm -hmm. It's nice. Hope I have something like this in my Good next deal, life. Because yeah. <laughs> I don't think I'll be taking Steve Vai with me. But <laughs> uh, what was the question? Uh, tell us about the Vi module. Oh, the Vi module. Okay. <laughs> like I said, <laughs> so um, I've had a great long relationship with Carvin, 
who made great stuff for me. I mean, the Legacy Amp was, that was my, my home, you know? But still, even with that, we would continue to develop it every year, because I just don't want to stay the same. So when, when Carvin kind of slowed down, it was time for me to move on. And when I discovered Synergy, I just felt like it was the opening of a Christmas gift. Because now I don't have to have just one amp. I can have many, you know. And, uh, but, it, but as much as I enjoyed all of the outstanding modules that they were making, my ear is so attuned to the sound of, like, the legacy, you know? So um, I was fortunate that the, the owner, Avi, was interested in making a signature model uh, module for me. And w I worked really closely with Peter Ahrens and Dave Friedman on building this module and fine-tuning it. And there it is. I mean, you can tell because one of those things doesn't look like the other. One of them's green. Do you see the green module there? That's the Vi module. And uh, so it has, a, it has that, it's beautiful. It's like a perfect evolution for me. Mm -hmm. But the other modules I have in here, hang on. Let me. What do I got here? Okay. Now this is a Plexi. So this, this one has an actual, uh, the preamp section uh, that resembles a Plexi, Marshall Plexi. And this was built by Dave Friedman. And um, uh, the B-Man is a baseman, Fender baseman. And I don't go anywhere without it now. It's such a beautiful sounding clean tone. You know, I, it, it is nothing like it. And I've compared all these with, the, with amps, the, the original amplifiers. And my ear, it's okay. <laughs> it's an outstanding comparison. And then the other one I got here is, uh, oh, that's the Deluxe. So these are the ones that I use in my rig, but I got another uh, rack in my rig. So, so actually with these four modules, that's four amplifiers, totally different amplifiers, you know? And uh, two channels in each, so I got like eight channels of, it's fantastic. Because more is more. More is more, right, right. So if, if I can, uh, can impose and ask you, could you uh, could we turn off the delays and listen to the vinyl? Turn modules? off the delays. Hey, hear the clean. I didn't sign up for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, I, I said I was imposing, so. <laughs> I'm kidding. I, I'm, I'm curious if you. Of course, if, I can. I can. Uh, it's fun. Uh, curious if you if you go for a like. I a can play without a delay. <laughs> Never mind. Nice, nice, nice. <laughs> So do you go for a pristine clean tone, or do you like to have a little bit of graininess to it, or how do you approach that? Well, well that's a good question, because it varies depending mm -hmm. on the song. If, if I want, like, a really clean tone, I'll, I'll go to the basement. I'm not sure how this pedal is set. <laughs> Yeah, if I want like a, this is the the bass one. Sounds. And it's got that kind of, which is really cool. But if I want. Uh, the, the, actually, the, the Vi module has a really nice clean. It's either really very clean or just kind of a little broken up. Right. And then you go to like the Marshall module, which is a totally different kind of a breakup sound. So there's so many options. It's really nice. Right, right. Yeah. And do you use the, uh, the second channel then typically to be a gain channel? Do you yes. set that up more for a, a rhythm type tone or is that yeah. your high gain sound? No, my, uh, my usual sound is I've got a clean, 
a dirty, which I use for rhythm when I play rhythm. <laughs> and then uh, when I solo, I kick in the Gemini. And the Gemini, the distortion just kind of adds a little bit of, little bit of juice, you know? Mm -hmm. Just kind of makes it a little more compressed, easier to play. Can we hear those with, with the, the straight in and, and the, uh, with the boost on? Sure, yeah. So, so this is the Gemini, uh, this is the, uh, the Vi module with the clean. And then this is the module with that, and the, just the plain dirty. Then when I want a solo, sometimes, most of the time, I... It's got a lot more. Yeah. Right, Thank right, you. right. And then with the delay? With the delay, it's... <laughs> Sounds, that sounds absolutely great. Sounds great. So completing the system then, you've got the modules. As, as you mentioned, you're playing into the stereo 50-watt tube yes. power amp. Yeah. And then driving two 4x12 cabinets. Yes. And do you have particular speakers that you like to hear in those cabinets? Yeah, I'm usually a 30-watt uh, Celestian guy. Uh -huh. Yeah. But one of the things that I'd love to share with you guitar players out there that's a real game changer for me when you're on a stage, a big stage. I don't have it set up here now, but uh, what I do is, uh, you know, as soon as you mic a cabinet and it goes through the monitoring system and that's what you're listening to when you're playing, your whole tone goes to shit, you know, because it's based on what kind of mics they're using, what the angle of the mic is, where it is on the speaker, what kind of s console the monitor system is, how good the monitor guy is. Right. Luckily, we got a good one tonight. <laughs> Monitors. <laughs> What's his name? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but still, what I do is I actually use speaker cabinets as small one one by twelves as my monitors, and they're fed directly from the amp. So there's no in-between processing. So when I'm playing, I'm hearing my real sound right in front of me. It, it looks like the fan is the thing that's blowing my hair back. <laughs> Dude. I'd be surprised if I could have children. <laughs> night after night. That's so awesome. So I'm going to impose one more time. OK. Could we ask Nick and Dave and Jacob to come back and you play another song for us? Sure. All right, is that all right? <laughs> I wish you would thank Steve for sharing his tone secrets and his thank rig you. with us. Incredible, right? Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to do a song here, another one we haven't rehearsed, but yeah, what the heck. You might know it.
Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the event. God bless you.